Alone, in the snowy backcountry, I was preparing to stay the night in my homemade snowmobile camper. Darkness had fallen, and I was unable to see anything save the dimly lit lantern and flickering fire at my feet. But there was something out there, and although I couldn't see it, I could certainly hear it. A blood-curdling cackle. What could it be? Stay tuned. Thanks to Thrunight for sponsoring this episode. I've partnered with them to create the new special edition Outsider Flashlight. At 2500 lumens, this handheld tactical flashlight is as bright as a pair of high beams on a car. If you'd like to check it out, I've included a link in the description below. Plus, a 20% off coupon code, which is good until December 14th, or until supplies last. I will also be talking more about it at the end of this episode. Chapter 1 Wolf Lullaby uh, Just bring them all out, we'll see how much we need. After taking inventory, packing up and strapping down, we were ready to go. We took our time on the first section of trail, as it was uneven in many places. Once we had passed through the thicker woodlands, we could finally pick up our pace along the main traces and open spaces. We eventually pulled into a small protected clearing within a cedar stand along the edge of a windswept glade.
Welcome to the Winter Outpost. The beauty of the sled shelter is that I can just as easily be somewhere else with it by the end of tomorrow. If I can pull the sled there, I can call it home. Although I had everything I needed to sleep and work out here, I wouldn't be able to stay this time around. That's because the day was nearing its end and I would have to run my dad home. The snowmobile camper is of course a one-man shelter. Maybe next year we'll build a second one so that my dad can join me, but I must be on my own for now. The wind grew stronger as evening approached. It came in big gusts that were becoming more frequent by the minute. I would return the following day on my own. Here we have a balanced diet for the hard-working woodsman. Turkey bacon, beans, and rocks. The truth is, I will be using the stones to heat the inside of my camper for the night. I've kept them dry over the course of winter, so the chance of them exploding in a fire is probably slim, as opposed to stones freshly gathered from water, which would have a much higher chance of exploding in the fire. Anyway, stones are great for quickly absorbing heat and slowly radiating it back out, which makes them a perfect heat source for the inside of my shelter. Once the rocks were hot enough, I placed them into two large ammo cans. A koi wolf had emerged from the tree line in the lower part of the glade and began to call. He 
he'd only be the first of many wolf calls I'd hear that night. Reclusive by nature, it is extremely difficult to catch even a glimpse of these beautiful creatures. But make no mistake, they are here. This is a clip I filmed a couple years ago in the exact same spot the drone is flying over right now. I ended up leaving the lids off because they had a rubber lining and I didn't want the rocks to melt them, especially inside my shelter. Some ammo cans also come with a plastic coating on the handles, which should also be removed. The heat from the stones can easily melt them as well, which would obviously create some dangerous fumes. Not something I'd want, especially in a small shelter like this. Now that the rocks and my supper were properly cooked, I decided to temporarily quench the fire. I only had so much dry wood with me, and I wanted to save the rest of it till later tonight, when I would reheat the stones one more time before bed. Although it looks like I've just killed the fire, all I did was put a pause on it. The underlying embers will eventually melt through the snow and I will be able to restart it when needed. I closed the shelter to allow the stones to heat up the inside. It didn't take long before it had warmed to a cozy 17 degrees Celsius. Just as I was setting my camera up to film the moon, I heard something rush right past me in the dark. I spun the camera around just in time to get a blurry shot of a ruffed grouse disappearing into the cedar thicket to roost. Did you see it? There would be no better place for it to hide, away from the reach of those hungry wolves. The rushing that I had suddenly heard was the wind from its wings as it passed right over my head.
While I waited for the shelter to warm, I decided to go on a walk before bed. I grabbed my hunting knife and high-powered flashlight for the short hike. I had been wanting to explore a small trail I had discovered behind my shelter that day, and now was my chance. Before I left, I placed the stones back onto the rekindled fire to reheat. I was surrounded on all sides by a chorus of howls, and it was beautiful. There is no equal to the symphonies that the Lord composes through his creation. I can attest to that. You think I would have remembered my snowshoes? Here are the tracks of the grouse who flew over my head earlier. Sleep well, my friend, but I'm sure the wolf lullaby will be of no comfort to you. I, however, enjoy their sorrowful song very much. Tired of falling through the snow, I return to the camper to grab my snowshoes before heading back out. Much better. Here's an old set of coyote tracks. Why don't we see where they go? Somewhere I can't follow.
Ah, uh, here's a familiar set of tracks. Home sweet home. I liked the ammo boxes because of their thin but tall profile. Their shape allowed me to place the rocks alongside my sleeping bag without sacrificing too much space. Although rocks can make good thermal batteries, I still had some concerns with them. I had to put great care into making sure that the ammo boxes didn't make direct contact with my sleeping bag or anything plastic, especially for the first couple of hours when the boxes were at their hottest. Once I had insulated the boxes with a thick towel, it was safe enough to touch, and therefore safe enough to have my sleeping bag against. Although the heated rocks are much safer to use in a shelter than fire, I figured there must be an even safer method. So next time I stay out here, I will use water as an alternative thermal battery to heat my camper with. I know it will be much safer, but I'm curious to see how efficient the water will be in comparison to the rocks. Anyway, I placed the rock radiators in the camper at 9.30, and they held the temperature steady at 17 degrees Celsius until midnight, peaking at 18 degrees Celsius for 30 minutes at one point. After midnight, the temperature slowly dropped into the wee hours of the morning, but by then I was already warm and snug, sound asleep under the covers. Ventilation is a must, especially in a shelter like this, so I installed two vents, one in each peak. I also left a gap for fresh air above the door. As I placed my hand near these vents, I could feel warm moist air leaving through the top vents, and cold fresh air seeping in from above the door. Next time I stay here, I will add some hot water jugs in with the rock radiators. I think it'd be a good experiment to see which system is best for keeping my shelter warm throughout the night, especially during those really cold nights we experience in the dead of winter. At this point though, winter is drawing to a close, so it certainly wasn't as cold as it could be. morning everyone uh, it uh, was a pretty good night actually I slept pretty good once I got in here and got settled uh, it is minus one degrees Celsius outside and it is nine degrees inside hold on a moment let me make a coffee first uh, I've had a really good night in here uh, I've been really warm and I've been really comfortable and I've done winter camping before uh, where I've stayed in snow huts or, or they're also known as Quincy's 
and I have stayed warm in them for the most part, but there's always a little edge of cold uh, that you can never get rid of. And so you just try and get through the night and, and uh, you can do it, but uh, there's just not that feeling of of comfort when you're inside a, uh, a snow cave, basically, although it is doable. But my point is that in here, it's just comfortable. Uh, I had no issues with sleeping. Uh, there wasn't that edge of cold at all. It was just really nice in here. So uh, for what I'm used to sleeping in during the winter time, this is like staying at a five-star hotel. This is really, really nice. The rock radiators did a really good job at, uh, at radiating their heat. As I feel them right now, they are a little bit warm, but uh, they've obviously given off most of their heat over the course of the night. What I really like about the rock radiators is that they do such a fantastic job at giving off an even heat. I mean that uh, spatially and as well as over time. Whenever I have a burner in here, which can only be for a short amount of time, because I don't like having open flames in such a small space, but whenever I have my burner on in here, the heat will just rise to the peak here and it'll be really, really hot here where, around where my head is. But as uh, it gets lower down to where my feet are, it's noticeably cooler. But uh, with the rock radiators, I noticed that the heat dispersal was incredibly even from the peak all the way down to the floor. The temperature was the same. So probably halfway through the night is when the temperature finally dropped down to about minus or sorry, plus eight degrees Celsius in here. But uh, now that I've gotten up and I've gotten out of my sleeping bag and out of my blankets, the temperature has risen back up in here to 11 degrees Celsius. So even by me just getting up and uh, getting out of my sleeping bag, the temperature has risen by three degrees Celsius. This shelter can be outfitted for uh, even more uh, cold weather. I have one inch foam board insulation all around me on the floors, uh, walls and ceiling, but I can easily add another inch of insulation uh, just by putting it on over top of everything and that would hold the heat even more. So that would make these, uh, these rock radiators even more efficient. Uh, so we'll see what I do with this shelter in the future. But uh, as of right now, I'm really happy with the way that it is. Moisture in here has been pretty good. Uh, there was only a very thin layer of moisture on the roof this morning, uh, but not enough to make water droplets or anything like that. And that's because of the vents that I have installed on both ends of the peak here. There, there obviously was enough space for the warmer, moister air to leave the shelter during the course of the night. I can hear a, a wolf howling out there right now as I'm talking. Uh, it, it was a pretty crazy night with uh, hearing all the howling. Uh, it was all around me and it was very close. Uh, so that was really neat to hear. <clears throat> anyway, I'm going to get up and get going now. All of my winter clothes are outside right now and they are freezing. They are literally frozen, probably. <laughs> uh, the reason why I didn't bring my winter clothes in with me is because I didn't want to bring all that moisture that they carried in here with me. Uh, because I didn't want that moisture being released in this small space uh, because then I probably would be having issues with condensation. So that'll be my coldest part of this whole trip is getting outside and getting in my winter clothes. I brought a solar panel out with me this time around. My next job is to find a system that works for it. These tracks belong to the koi wolf who was howling from the lower end of the glade last evening. Happy trails. Chapter 2 
Canadian gold. Today we'll be towing the camper to a part of the forest that is near a maple stand, just in time for maple syrup season. While I'm there, I will collect sap from a handful of maples to boil down into maple syrup. We left the sheltered clearing where I had previously been based with the camper and hit the trail for the maple stand. When we had finished towing the camper to its new location, Senior Outsider left for home while I prepared to stay the night. Last time, I heated the camper's interior using rocks which I had warmed in the fire. This time, I will use water instead of rocks to heat my camper with. I made the switch because I wanted to see which material makes the best thermal battery to heat my little shelter with. On one hand, rocks can be heated much hotter than water. But on the other hand, water seems to absorb and radiate heat more efficiently than rocks can. With all that in mind, I was curious to see what my findings would be. The ammo cans I used for the heated rocks probably held a combined weight of 45 pounds, while the water jugs held a combined weight of 88 pounds, almost double. So I must admit that my comparison between the two thermal batteries isn't exactly fair, but it's worth noting that the water was easier to gather and transport than the rocks. Plus, the rocks have only one use, whereas the water is useful for all sorts of things. I 
I chose to pack a no-cook supper for tonight. Maple candied salmon, cheese, macaroni salad, bread, strawberries, and carrots. Easy to carry, even easier to prepare, and tasty to eat. After reheating the canteens, I went on a short walk before turning in for the night. The water heated the camper to a peak temperature of 21 degrees Celsius, slightly warmer than the rocks, which heated the camper to a peak temperature of 18 degrees Celsius on a night of similar outdoor temperature. Even though the water jugs did eventually lose their heat partway through the night, just like the rocks did, the warmth they produced kept me comfortable until morning. That's because by the time the temperature in the camper had begun to drop, I was already warm and snug underneath my blankets. Next time, I think I will wrap the water jugs in thick wool blankets to ensure that their heat loss is slowed and lengthened over the course of the entire night. I could also use the rocks and water jugs in tandem, the more thermal mass, the better. Once I had laid my head down on the pillow, it wasn't long until nighttime darkness dissolved into morning light. Maple sap only runs for about a month in the spring, when temperatures average minus 5 degrees Celsius at night and plus 5 degrees Celsius during the day.
Gathering sap won't harm the tree if done correctly. Here's how. The depth of the borehole should be between two and two and a half inches. I put some electrical tape at the two inch mark on my drill bit to ensure that I didn't drill any deeper than necessary. The hole should be just big enough for the spiral to fit snugly inside it, which means that either a 5 16th or a 7 16th drill bit will do the job. The hole should also be drilled at a slight upward angle to help the sap flow more easily into the spile. A few gentle taps is all that's needed to set the spile in place. A heavier hammering could risk splitting the wood and harming the tree. Of course, only healthy maples should be tapped in the first place. And I don't collect sap from anything that is less than 30 inches in diameter. Some resources say that smaller maples can be tapped, but I prefer not to potentially stress the younger ones, especially when larger trees can be found. Contrary to popular belief, the holes do not need to be plugged after sap collection is complete. If the tree is healthy, which it should be, since it was selected for tapping, it will begin to heal itself once the spile is removed. There are many who have claimed that the hole needs to be plugged with inferior materials, such as beeswax, dowels, or twigs, but there is no substitute for the tree's own healing ability. Within a couple years, the maple tree will have filled the hole in all by itself. For example, here's what a maple looks like a couple years after it has been tapped. The hole is sealed shut and the tree is no worse for wear. I've heard from several experienced sap collectors who have experimented with plugging spile holes as opposed to leaving them alone. These people have noted that introducing a foreign body into the tree does more damage to it than good. They said that while things looked sealed on the outside, the plugs had often begun to spread rot on the inside of the trunk. In fact, the rot could only be seen after the tree had died and been cut into. So that's why it's good to leave these trees alone to do what they do best. As a personal rule, I don't gather sap from the same tree two years in a row. But the general rule is that a tree can be tapped consecutively, as long as the holes are spaced at least six inches apart from the previous year. I tapped about eight trees this year and let them run for several days before returning to gather the sap. My friend Koto joined me later that morning to help with the boil down. As you can see here, we'd already collected our firewood and were ready to go. At the collection stage, the sap looks and tastes like water, with only a hint of sweetness. It only becomes maple syrup once the sap has been boiled down. Boiling sap removes most of its water, allowing the sugar to concentrate. On average, it takes 40 liters of sap to make one liter of syrup. As the sap reduced in the pans, we made sure to keep topping them up with fresh sap until there was no more left to add. As the sap reduced further, it changed from a clear watery appearance to a pale yellow. Eventually, it will take on a beautiful amber color, which maple syrup is known for. Near the end of the day, the sap had reduced to the point where we were able to combine the pans into one. It. We took the remaining sap home for the finishing boil, as the wood fire would have been too hot for the final stage. 
Once the sap had reached 217 degrees Celsius on the candy thermometer, it had officially become maple syrup. The eight trees I'd collected sap from over the course of several days had produced two liters of maple syrup in total, which filled four of these half-liter jars. We gave half away to friends and family and kept the other half for ourselves. A lot of love goes into making genuine maple syrup, but nothing can compare to how good it tastes. Maple syrup season has always been an exciting time for me, not only because I get to make maple syrup, but because it also means that building season for the log cabin will soon begin. Chapter 3. Strange Silence Let me introduce you to my DIY snowmobile camper. I built it last year with my dad, and I've taken it on several trips since then. This year, I doubled the insulation, and I'm currently prepping to take it on its first tour this winter. After making provisions for my fair feathered friends, I could now see to my own. I've been looking forward to this trip because I will finally get to field test a heating system which I've developed for the camper. The weather report says it's going to be a cold one tonight, so here's hoping my homemade water heater will keep me warm enough. With the loaded camper in tow, I was underway. Through snowy glade and along forest trail I went. It was a day of mixed weather, overcast in the morning and snowy in the afternoon, with the odd patch of sun. As the afternoon grew later and the journey extended further, the trees together drew closer and my pace noticeably lesser. It was as I traced between the closely knit cedars that I decided it was best to stop for the night. I didn't want to find myself at the end of a trail with no easy way to turn around. 
I began to look for a small clearing that I could camp in. Well, it wasn't much of an opening, but it will have to do for the night. On the upside, the dense tree cover will provide excellent shelter from the wind. It was time to settle in. After establishing the fire, my next job was to get the heater going. I filled the ammo can with a 50-50 mixture of environmentally friendly antifreeze and water, totaling about 30 liters of liquid. To keep it from being knocked over in the night, I made sure to anchor the ammo can to the wall. Next was the copper coil, which I had placed inside this lobster pot filled with sand. Finally, I hooked the outside coil up to the ammo box inside the camper, using two hot water lines which I fed through a port in the camper floor. I added pool noodles to the exposed water lines to insulate them from the cold and minimize their heat loss. After placing the coil on the fire, I noted that it took an hour for the water to begin circulating. Since I've already spoken about this system in another episode, which I've linked in the description, I will give just a summary of how it works here. Basically, the water in the ammo can travels down into the coil where it's heated in the fire. 
the heated water then circulates back into the ammo can. As the water continues to circulate and heat up, the ammo can then radiates that heat into the camper. Once the fire goes out, the sand in the lobster pot and the water in the ammo can will act as thermal batteries, radiating their heat into the camper until it eventually dissipates. The hope is that the ammo can will absorb enough thermal energy from the fire to keep the camper warm until morning. That's the hope at least. Once hooked up, I made sure that all three of the tank's valves were fully opened. The lower valve on the side is where cooler water flows out to the coil. The upper valve on the same side is where heated water from the coil circulates back into the ammo can. And finally, the valve at the very top acts as a vent. This vent is extremely important because it prevents pressure from building up in the system. It is also directed outside with a hose to prevent the camper from filling up with moisture. Anyway, that's basically how the whole thing works. After the system had taken several hours to sufficiently store the campfire's thermal energy, the camper temperature had risen to a toasty 21 degrees Celsius and rising, while outside it was minus 11 degrees and falling. The camper would eventually reach a peak temperature of 24 degrees Celsius or 75 degrees Fahrenheit, even though I had left the door wide open several times throughout the evening. I noticed that there seemed to be a fair amount of steam escaping from the vent hose. This concerned me because I didn't want to lose too much water and therefore the camper's warmth to evaporation. However, when I checked the water level in the tank the next day, I saw that there had hardly been any loss at all. Once it seemed that the water in the ammo can was about to boil, I removed the coil from the fire and allowed the system to coast for a little bit. The good news is that the water continued to circulate anyway, but no longer at a runaway pace. I decided to go on a short walk to stretch my legs one last time before going to bed. I've never gone a night out here without hearing at least one howl, and often many more. But tonight, the forest was unusually silent. Were they sleeping, or were they watching? The temperature was continuing to fall and would reach minus 18 degrees Celsius or zero degrees Fahrenheit by the wee hours of the morning. So I figured the coyotes had tucked themselves away in their warm dens, and I would be wise to do the same. When the fire had died down, I set the coil back onto the coals, which is where I left it for the night. Yeah. 
In order to keep the heat inside the camper, I would not be opening the door again until morning. Once inside, I could finally sit down to eat one of my trademark no-cook suppers. Smoked salmon, pepperettes, fruit, macaroni salad, and some trail mix. It isn't fancy, but it's practical. So as you can see, I'm settled in for the night. And although it's a typical winter's night outside at minus 12 degrees Celsius, inside it's a cozy 22 degrees Celsius. Uh, what I did before I came in was I let the fire die down just to the coals and I have the lobster pot or the copper coil sitting on those coals right now. Uh, so as the night continues, uh, that heat will slowly dissipate. Uh, but for now, those coals are just keeping the system uh, warmer for a little bit longer. Hopefully, uh, I can make it mostly to the morning uh, with this place being nice and warm. I also have an electric 12-volt blanket uh, inside my sleeping bag. Uh, so that's keeping me warm if it gets cold in here. So I'm really curious to see how the heat will dissipate if it will happen quickly or slowly over the course of the night, I'm just not sure. So I'll have to check back in with you in the morning on that. But the good thing is that this whole thing is insulated quite nicely. So the floor is insulated, the walls and the ceiling uh, is also insulated. I have two inches of uh, insulation on the walls and above me I have uh, an inch of insulation, of uh, foam board insulation. Uh, followed by two inches of, of space, uh, which is where the roof rafters run. And then underneath that, there's an inch and a half of foam board insulation, followed by uh, this cedar lumber here. So I think with the combination of uh, having a couple sheets of foam board insulation above me uh, and having some air between them, I think it'll make this roof really good for uh, holding the heat uh, that much longer. For how long? I don't know. So again, I'll have to check back in with you in the morning on that one. If you've been following along with my channel, uh, you'll know that I've been developing this ammo can heater or this copper coil heater for several episodes now. In the summertime, I came up with a concept design and I was pleased with the results, uh, but I also knew that there was some room for improvement. So through some research of my own and just some observations that I had made, I began to refine the system. At the same time, I had received so many comments from the outsider community, uh, so many great ideas and suggestions to help refine the system further, uh, just from different people all over the world, different walks of life, uh, different skill sets and expertise. It was just really great hearing from all of you. So I've taken some of these suggestions and I've implemented them to just make a better system. Uh, I received several comments from people suggesting that I use pool noodles to insulate the water lines and they are no doubt helping to improve the efficiency of the system uh, because there isn't as, uh, as much heat loss uh, as they travel between the fire and the camper. I had also received so many suggestions from people uh, saying that I should use antifreeze in the system. And initially, I just didn't want to use antifreeze because uh, all the antifreeze that I've known is bad for the environment. So if uh, I were to accidentally spill, it would be bad for the animals and for the plant life in the area. But as I read further through the suggestions, uh, there were people saying that there's actually an environmentally friendly antifreeze that you can buy and it's called RV antifreeze. So having uh, the RV antifreeze mixed in with everything uh, just gives me that peace of mind knowing that uh, these lines aren't going to freeze up on me. So that's been uh, a great suggestion that I've really appreciated. So I say all that to say a big thank you to the outsider community. I have really appreciated your suggestions and really you've helped me refine the system. So this is as much your project as it is mine. So thank you so much. So here's a look at the foot of the bed. I've got everything packed in. Uh, on the right side I have my drone bag which uh, it has to stay inside here so that the batteries don't freeze. Uh, the same thing with my uh, camera bag has my camcorder and GoPro. Over here I have a power bank which is running uh, the electric blanket in my sleeping bag and of course the ammo can heater. Uh, it's really nice that it's at the foot of my bed uh, so that I can put my feet up against it and uh, it keeps me nice and warm. So I can actually stretch out in here uh, but there's no more extra room. So yeah, um, I think I'm ready to turn for the night and uh, I'll see you in the morning.
Once I had left the coil on the coals and gone inside for the night, the ammo box continued to steadily gurgle away for another hour. After that, the circulation slowed to a gentler pace. Just as it had taken the system four hours to reach peak circulation, it took the same amount of time for the circulation to stop after the fire had died down. Then the system coasted on whatever thermal energy it was able to store, which lasted me pretty much until the morning. Well, good morning. It's 8 a.m. and I'm just nicely getting up. As I look at the indoor-outdoor thermometer, it's minus 17 degrees Celsius outside and it's plus 13 degrees Celsius inside. So that's a 30 degree difference. It's still fairly warm in here, uh, especially considering how cold it is outside this morning. Now in Fahrenheit, outside it's right around zero degrees, uh, maybe one degree or something like that. And inside it's 55 degrees Fahrenheit. So that's uh, pretty much a 55 degree difference uh, in Fahrenheit. Uh, so obviously the ammo box heater has been doing its job quite well. Now, of course, this place would be warmed a little bit by my own body heat, uh, and I have had the electric blanket running throughout the night, uh, but it is a 12-volt blanket, so it's not putting out a lot of heat, just a little bit uh, inside my sleeping bag. Uh, so I, I'm not sure how much that's producing, but uh, as I feel the ammo box heater, uh, it's a little bit warm to the touch, uh, just slightly above room temperature. Uh, when, I, when I turned in for the night, uh, the ammo box was too hot to touch. Uh, the water was still quite hot, it was circulating well, and I could hear it circulating uh, for about an hour uh, to two hours after I came in. So uh, the, the lobster pot in the, in the sand, which uh, is holding the coil, did a good job at uh, retaining that heat and continuing to circulate even once the fire had, had died down to coals. Now I'm guessing that although I stopped hearing it circulate uh, an hour or two after I came in, I think it was still circulating a little bit. It just was circulating so slowly that I really couldn't hear it happening in the tank. Last time I stayed in the snowmobile camper, I, uh, I boiled some water outside on the campfire and I filled up two uh, military canteens and I put them in here uh, and they stayed hot for, I would say, three to four hours. Um, but until they lost pretty much all of their heat and by morning there wasn't any heat left in them. Uh, so that leads me to believe that uh, there must have been just a little bit of circulation uh, throughout the night, uh, maybe even into the morning as it's sitting on some of those coals. As far as my overall thoughts about the ammo box heater are concerned, I would say that this is obviously a system that works. It could use some refinement. It does need some babysitting. For example, if I had just left this ammo box uh, in the roaring fire, it would probably begin to boil, uh, which isn't a great thing. Uh, everything's sealed up, but I wouldn't want to, uh, to push the seals past their limits and uh, the, the boiling point would do that. Uh, so I wouldn't trust the system to leave it in the fire and go to bed like that, uh, just because it just might begin to heat out of control. Uh, so that's why I left it on the coals, although it would have been nicer to have a little bit of a fire burning with it, but I just don't want to go back out and tend the fire. Once I close this door, I'm in for the night because I don't want to open this again and let all of that hard earned heat out of here. The downside of this ammo box heater is that it's really, really clunky, but it works. So I would say this is a great system in an off-grid application, but I would prefer to leave it hooked up. But since I'll be packing up the camper this morning and heading out, uh, that means I'm going to have to break the system back down again and get it all packed up, which is a bit of a pain. So if I were staying here multiple nights or for an extended period of time, this system would make a lot more sense. But uh, overall, I'm happy with how effective it seems to be. I'm quite warm in here, even though it's uh, fairly cold outside this morning. Anyway, I'm gonna get my stuff together now and head out. When I was able to check the water lines in the morning, I noticed that the liquid inside had turned to slush. I guess that's what I get for using a half mixture. I was just happy that I didn't use straight water after all, because if I did, the lines would no doubt have frozen solid, likely cracking the coil and rendering my system useless.
As I rejoined the trail that morning, my head was already filled with new improvements and designs for my little snowmobile camper, which means that more of these episodes are on the way. Thanks again to Through Night for sponsoring this episode. Hey everyone, Outsider here. I'm excited to show you the new special edition Outsider flashlight which Through Night is releasing this year. And if you look here on this light, you'll see there is the Outsider crest just underneath the button. And that's how you know it's an Outsider flashlight. When you go into a box store, pay attention to the lumens that are on the box of those flashlights. Even the bigger flashlights, those big security flashlights, most of them will max out at around 900 lumens, whereas this one will max out at just over 2,500 lumens, so over two and a half times brighter. In fact, I think it's about the equivalent of the brightness of most car headlights. So if you were to take your car headlights and condense them down into a flashlight, this is exactly what it would look like. And that's because it uses a high quality LED, uh, so it has that really bright output, and it has a uh, great big lithium ion battery inside. I mean, it's, it's small, it's compact, but it's got 5,000 milliamp hours of power in it. So it's got a huge power capacity. So this flashlight is not only much brighter than most flashlights on the market today, but it also lasts longer than other flashlights on the market. As well, it's uh, made in this aircraft grade aluminum body, so it can take a punishment. I've dropped these through night flashlights on the ground. I've had them in the snow, underwater, I even froze one in a block of ice once and it still worked. So that is a testament to how strong these things are. And as well, just the fact that I have put my name on one of their flashlights shows just how much I believe in the quality of their products. Right now, ThruNight has a special deal on for the Outsider flashlight. If you head over to ThruNight.com and use the coupon code OUTSIDERTT20, you will get 20% off the total price of the special edition light. However, this deal is only on until December 14th, or until supplies last. The Outsider TT20 is red, making it easy to find even when accidentally dropped on the trail. But if red isn't your color, then you should check out the Outsider TC15 in Coyote Tan, which I will also link in the description below. Now let's talk about the features of the Outsider TT20. First of all, it comes with a lithium ion battery, which can be charged right inside the flashlight via a USB-C charging port on the side, which means that most Android phone users can charge the Outsider TT20 with the same cord they use to charge their phone with. Even if you don't have a charging cord, fear not, because the flashlight comes with its own anyway. Not to mention holster, lanyard, clip, and extra seals. The Outsider TT20 has two switches, one on the tail and the other on the side. The tail switch is easy to find, meaning no more fumbling in the dark to find it. When pressed, the tail switch activates the light in its brightest setting, or turbo, which is over 2500 lumens. The side switch can also be used to turn the flashlight on and off, but it is mainly used to control the flashlight settings. From Firefly mode, which is good for reading things in the dark without destroying your night vision. Strobe, which can be used to signal for help or disorient an attacker. And finally, the side switch also controls the flashlight's level of brightness. The flashlight can also be locked out, which prevents it from accidentally being turned on while in your pocket or backpack. Anyway, that's it for now. Until next time, my friends, stay safe, be well, and God bless.